All right, everyone. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. We have um, a number of people I think who will still be joining, but they can pick up when they get here. And we are recording tonight's lecture as well. So we're excited to share that um, afterwards. But hello, um, I'm Catherine Ridley. I am the Vice President of Education and Communications at 100 Miles. And we're so excited to um, host tonight's lecture. We've had a busy fall of programming, of course, with our Naturalist 101 series. And um, we're we're taking a little bit of a virtual break um, versus an in-person lecture this evening, which is wonderful um, because it allows us to welcome um, our presenter from afar, as well as um, uh, host a number of attendees who might not otherwise be able to be here in person. So we appreciate everyone's time this evening. Um, for our Naturalist 101 series. If you haven't um, looked ahead uh, to the rest of the calendar, or if you just like to keep track of these offerings, you can go to 100miles.org slash naturalist101 um, and see our upcoming programming. But we're going to get started this evening because we're so excited to have Dr. Michael Moore um, joining us this evening. Um, we've been looking forward to this and it coincides nicely. Most of you know that as we head into November and into the winter here in coastal Georgia, um, we have a really incredible uh, North Atlantic right whale that comes down to our coast um, and really nowhere else in the world to give birth. Um, the Georgia and North Florida coasts are unique and critical to this uh, species, which is um, facing just really dire um, conservation threats. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. But beyond just talking about the right whale, we're also talking about what our personal responsibility is um, and how we can help as individuals. I think so many of us who are doing this work and many of you on the call who are, are engaged in this work, it's, it's a challenge and it's hard to keep going <laughs> sometimes in the face of such um, such a severe threat to this animal. So that's the focus of tonight. Um, and we um, had reached out to Dr. Moore and have been excited to, to welcome him. Welcome him. Um, he is um, affiliated with the Woods Hole um, Oceanographic Institute, um, which is in Massachusetts. Um, he has a veterinary degree. I'm going to post his um, full um, bio in the chat that you can read um, and learn a little bit more, as well as some articles about his work um, with the whales, including right here in coastal Georgia. Um, but I know you're not here to hear me speak, so I am going to turn it over to Dr. Moore, have him join us, and there will be time for Q&A. Um, what I'm going to ask for folks to do is go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box. So rather than the chat, look for the Q&A box. And if you just pop those in as you think of them, we'll be answering them at the end of tonight's lecture. So Dr. Moore, welcome. Thank you for being here. And we're looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. And I'm kind of on the edge of losing my voice. But I, so forgive me if I if I start to croak. So as you've heard, my name is Michael Moore. I'm a veterinarian at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. It's not an institute. I always feel like an institute is going to put me away somewhere. Or maybe I, I was put away somewhere. Anyway, it's also known as HUI, W-H-O-I. So I spent much of my working life fussing about the life, health, and death of North Atlantic right whales. In 2021, I published this book. You can see the cover page on the left there titled, We Are All Whalers. My premise is that whether we are killing whales with harpoons or with our wallets as consumers, we are all complicit in their demise. So tonight, I will try to make that case. I've got to figure out how to advance the slide here. There we go. So this video is of a filter feeding North Atlantic right whale suckling her calf in Cape Cod Bay, Massachusetts last March. The individually distinctive markings enable a detailed catalog of each whale's life history. They migrate from Florida, where they calve, and Georgia, to New England and Eastern Canada, where they feed. Thus, we have a detailed record of the population status through time, as shown in this graph. Oh, I'll show you the graph later. I, edited, I didn't edit that right. 
they peaked in 2010 and they've been declining since then. The, um, the video here we took with a drone last March and I, I, you probably saw the, the calf tucking underneath the mom there. And it's just something that uh, I, I can't really express the wonder it was to sort of drive the drone uh, and gently over the animal and and watch all this unfolding in front of our eyes. And I'm glad to share it with you tonight because it's something I'm, I, I just find mesmerizing. And I wanted to set that up. And this these words are from the premise of the book. Recently, I spent an early April day in the southwestern corner of Cape Cod Bay in eastern Massachusetts with a friend. He'd been at sea his entire working life, but had never knowingly been close to a right whale. His day job was master of an oil tanker on the Valdez, Alaska to San Francisco, California run, where he might have been close to a North Pacific right whale. He was vastly overqualified to skipper our boat, which he did while I piloted a small drone to measure the lengths and widths of the many feeding North Atlantic right whales we had found in a small area. There was no wind that day. The sea was like a mill pond. It was crisp, cold, sunny, and quiet. We shut down the motor, drifted, watched, and listened. As each animal surfaced, exhaled, and immediately inhaled, we listened to the unique cadence of their breaths, and we watched their steady progress through the water with their mouths wide open, filtering the clouds of their food close to the surface. Periodically, they slowly closed down on the, closed on the boat, and we would see into their open mouths with small eddies of water peeling away from their lips. Much larger eddies formed in their wakes as their powerful tails and bodies pushed them along. They made tight turns using their huge flippers and tails as rudders to keep themselves within the food patches. This went on all day as the sun started to sink behind the cliffs on the nearby western shore of Cape Cod Bay. Their creamy white upper jaws, just visible above the surface, turned to a vibrant golden hue. It was a peaceful, majestic, timeless sight and a huge privilege to be permitted to study these animals. I've always been intrigued by whales, the smart, air-breathing mammals living in the water. Sperm whales dive on a single breath for more than an hour, and right whales don't dive for so long, but they too have extraordinary adaptations for eating swarms of animals that are half the size of a grain of rice. This aerial image of a skim-feeding right whale on its left side shows it with an open mouth and the thickened skin patches on its head that enable us to recognize and catalog individuals. So that we call these callosities, and you can see them here along the, the ridge of the upper jaw. And again, there's one just by the eye here, the eyebrow callosity, and also some chin callosities and the lip there. This is unique, this guy. Uh, he's called callosity back because he's also got some callosities on the back as well. So as an undergraduate, I helped on a study of humpback whale behavior in Newfoundland. The image on the left gives a sense of our human resources. I learned a bit about what it means to be a whale and was first exposed to the issue of their entanglement in fishing gear. My first job after graduating as a, as a veterinarian, though, was as an observer on an Icelandic whale catcher, just like the one shown on the right here. They, they look out for the whales up here and the skipper runs down the catwalk and fires the harpoon gun with a grenade on the end of it. And from the book again, spending the three weeks aboard the Fala 6 was a unique experience. I'd been at sea for quite some time in a variety of vessels by that time in my life, but it was the first time I'd been in an industrial marine environment, which such highly engineered equipment is specialized for what was inherently a dangerous undertaking, given the high explosives, grenades, lines under heavy loads, large winches and huge powerful animals. I came away with respect for the seamanship I'd observed and the skilled human actions required to operate engineered systems to accomplish the task. So, and you know, I, I should sort of elaborate there a little bit. I was also disgusted with the, um, with the end result of the whaling, but we we looked at the efficacy of how well these harpoons worked and frankly they worked very well and it wasn't until much later that i got involved in the entanglement side that i started to put all of that into perspective and recently i got criticized by a very 
august reviewer about this book saying that um you know there's a fundamental difference between murdering whales with harpoons and and killing them by mistake if you consume goods that were brought by sea and a sh ship struck the whale and my response to that is that if i was a whale i really wouldn't worry too much about the motivation for why i got killed or or, or dragged around in fishing gear whether, whether it was a murder or whether it was a mistake is <laughs> really pretty irrelevant Hence the title, I guess. And it, it wasn't until I read that review that I, I really felt that that was, um, that was real. So anyway, whaling is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as the action, practice, or business of catching whales, nothing about intent. Thus, we are all figurative whalers. In the book, I describe how my first job after veterinary school was an observer for the International Whaling Commission to study the efficacy of explosive harpoons. The median time to death of fin whales killed in Icelandic waters was four minutes. Then I tell, many years later, I began to examine right whales on the beaches from Florida to Canadian Maritimes. Some of them were hit by vessels, and these were most likely died within hours, if not minutes. The right whale on the bottom of the slide was killed by serial propeller slices into its lung cavity. But we also examined right whales killed by rope entanglement. In the book, I describe presenting data showing that lethally entangled right whales take six months to die on average. And my naive belief that once this was known, the problem would be solved. That was 18 years ago. The entangled right whale at the top right was found dead in Virginia some months after first seen entangled in Canadian waters. And actually, I'll come back to that animal uh, later in the talk as well, maybe a couple of times. It's an animal that has caused me many sleepless nights. So here it is, um, number 2301. Uh, I'm going to tell you the story in the whale's voice. Now, this is something I did in the book a few times uh, to have the presumption that it was an appropriate thing to do, and I've been criticized for doing that also. But... I'll leave it to you to decide whether or not it's an appropriate thing. Anyway, we examined this animal when it was dead in Virginia. So the, from the whale. When it happened, my calf had been weaned for less than a year, so I was still skinny and hungry all the time. I'd found a really good patch of food. I can't see where I was. I ran into some fairly light line, but before I knew it, I was tangled up. I had it in my mouth, over my blowhole, and tightly wrapped around my left flipper. You can see the line running from its mouth over its left nostril in this image. I'm ashamed to say that I panicked. I twisted, turned, rolled, thrashed, and charged around like a crazy whale. I was able to get the trap hooked on a rock and broke that off, but I was still left with an ugly mess of rope. I could feel all the knots and twists. Every time I swam, I felt fresh stabbing pain, especially around my left flipper. I could see the rope cutting into the flesh, and eventually I felt it start to cut into the bone. My left blowhole was becoming increasingly useless. I carried that rope around for weeks and months. And then January 20, 2005, my left flipper felt like it was dead. Lice had spread out around my blowhole and left flipper. I was losing all that beautiful fat that I'd been laying down for my next calf. I felt desperate. The last thing I remember was heading south to warmer water as I was getting really cold with no fat between the water and myself. Most entangled whales do not die, but their reproductive health can be seriously compromised. As rope quality has improved in recent decades, entanglement trauma has become more severe, and climate change has also affected right whale foraging success, both having resulted in loss of body condition and reduced carving, as shown here. And you can see here the timeline from 2007 to this year. And the number of calves born has uh, certainly not improved and somewhat gone down on average over, over this time frame. And here's another right whale from Cape Cod Bay who's looking very skinny, whereas the calf is looking a lot plumper. And they grow really fast. So these guys are much smaller when, when you see them in Georgia. And the moms often bring them up to Cape Cod Bay. And I think we saw five different mother calf pairs this year. And there were, I think, maybe maybe nine altogether, I forget. 
It's all a blur. So to take a closer look at the North Atlantic right whale through the lens of the drone that we've been flying in Cape Cod Bay since 2016, in this 2021 study, we compared the growth of North Atlantic right whales born in different decades. The dashed outline here, you can see all these different outlines. In each panel represents the estimated body length for a whale of each given age born in 1981 with no history of entanglements or maternal entanglements. We found that entanglements in fishing gear associated with shorter whales and the body lengths have been decreasing since 1981. This loss of growth potential is extremely worrying. The smaller and the skinnier you are, the more less likely you are to become pregnant. And that this is a fundamental piece of how the ability of these animals to reproduce and recover from the mortalities they've been facing is an uphill battle. And we'll look at the numbers in a bit too. So the sum of all this is that today, right whales are skinnier, shorter, and take longer to get pregnant and produce fewer and smaller calves. And this, this graphic here just summarizes what, that, what I've said. You know, when you get a few impacts, the animals are fat and they've got lots of blubber. And the timeline for pregnancy, lactation, and recovery is the standard of three years calving interval. Whereas if you get more impacts, such as entanglements, vessel strikes, climate change, too much noise and bombs or whatever's going on, surveying for, you know, oil or gas, this timeline gets stretched and the whales are fewer, smaller and skinnier. So this last spring, I was invited to testify at a, at a um, house hearing of the um, Natural Resources Committee, a subcommittee of it. And what I did was I took the um, data from the counts, the best estimate count models of how many whales were, and it peaked out here in 2010. And also the black line is the number of breeding females alive. And all I did was I made an average loss rate from 2011 on in both cases. And the blue dotted line does that average down to 2045. And the black line is down to 2035. And, but when you have no more breeding females, you have no more potential for the species to recover. So happily, uh, those numbers have changed a little bit since I plotted this graph for that hearing. The hearing was it was a joke. Uh, you know, there was predetermined expectations on both sides, and no no ground was given, nor expected really. But I, I was uh, categorized as a parasite of the state, essentially, and I wanted to ask one of the one of the folks who were feeling quite negative about my presence as to whether they could tell me where the Gulag train was because it was time to leave. But I didn't ask her that, but it, it was a pretty bizarre. And, I, and you know, I, I I cannot believe how people can still work and survive in that toxic environment. But anyway, there we are. Meanwhile, uh, just last week, the New England Aquarium with Noah released uh, more data. And here's this inflection at 2010 still. and Newer numbers have at least shown a glimmer of hope that things have at least leveled out somewhat. But we're certainly not back here, and we're not winning the battle. We're at a bit of a stalemate at the moment. So this is the best population estimate through 2022. So what's been going on? Well, the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming ocean areas in the world. Right whale food has shifted from north to the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada. And as you can see, this is in um, April 2010 through 2013. This is where all the right whales were sighted or heard in those years. And then fast forward 10 years, April, March, May, May 2020 to 
So 10 years later, we've had a massive shift to this part of the habitat. They're still here. Uh, you know, you can't say they're not in the Gulf of Maine because they certainly are. And obviously, they've continued to go south to you guys. But increasingly, we're beginning to see calving events that are <clears throat> north of the traditional Georgia, Florida calving areas. So this migration to Canada has exposed them to new vessel and entanglement trauma threats. And as a result, uh, conservation measures that were brought into play, say, in the Bay of Fundy for vessel strikes, which were done in the early 2000s, have now had to be reinvented and rejiggered and readjusted to this new area up here. And, and the Canadians, though, are working very hard at it and doing quite well. So, and the U.S. too is trying. <laughs> so, to prevent death and injury from vessel strikes, we can slow vessels down in right whale habitat. However, current U.S. proposals are getting significant pushback. There's an ongoing consideration to substantially expand seasonal management areas in terms of 10 knot speed restrictions and to reduce minimum length of vessels affected to those to those limits from 64 feet to 35 feet. Still unclear whether they're going to become law or not. Their efficacy will depend upon the degree of monitoring, enforcement, and the scale of the deterrence. Why has this taken so long? And I guess the answer is that there is paralytic stakeholder and legal debate and the way the system is set up is that it's really hard to achieve any meaningful change when there is foot dragging built into the whole legal management process. The U.S. laws and the bizarre nature of the U.S. political system do not give managers the teeth and adaptability necessary to get their jobs done. But this... If these speed limits come in, then there's some serious um, optimism that one might follow with that. You know, I was listening to, well, one of the other people in this hearing uh, was a fisherman, a recreational charter fisherman who ran center console boats out to the edge for tuna fishing off of New Jersey to the shelf edge. And the average speed of the day trips, the 90 miles they do, is 45 knots or greater. And they do 70 if the wind's picking up and they have to come home. And so a 10-knot speed limit was an anathema to that guy, and I totally understand it from his point of view. But, you know, what do we care about is the, 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 re, the repeating dry, the issue that we, we need to figure out. So with, with that um, sort of digression into vessel strike, I'm now going to talk a little bit more about the technology that has enabled um, buoy line closures. Um, and this is really where we're headed with regards to um, taking care of the entanglement problem. Because while the vessel strike problem is a very significant mortality problem, and to a degree... Uh, a problem with entanglement. Uh, with, excuse me, with um, sublethal vessel strikes, and we probably have more than we know of because if the, the if they're hit by a blunt part of the ship, but not the propeller, there's no obvious surface trauma that we can document. Whereas with propellers, you see the bread slicing going up the side of the animal. So, however, the the entanglement side, obviously, again, there's there's mortality, but there's a huge amount of sublethal damage and trauma to these animals from sublethal wounds, but also the drag of the rope that they're still towing. And it's, it's very complicated and it goes on a long time. And we've calculated some of the energetic sides of it and essentially an average entanglement can be energetically equivalent to the cost of gestating a calf. Now, lactation is more, but the actual cost of a calf is the equivalent to lactation. So if that's taken out of the budget, 
mom's not going to be able to get fat enough to get pregnant to do what she has to do or worse if she's entangled once she's pregnant then things go seriously wrong some of you may remember the case of snow cone quite recently and we don't know for sure but it seems as though that was a, a sad ending so the primary cause of entanglements is from vertical lines in the water uh, lobster trap lines in u.s waters and lobster and crab trap lines in canada but the good news is that there are new options for removing those lines from the water that don't involve closing down the fisheries. And we've got this um, on-demand or ropeless group that meets every year now. I mean, we met up in Canada last week, and it was really exciting to see how diverse and progressive uh, the, this technology has become. I'll show you a little bit of how it, how it works. So the left panel, excuse me, hang on a sec. shows how seafood is trapped traditionally with the sinking ground line and ropes to each trap, and these are called gangens, and an end line going up to a ball, which is marked with the, with the owner's ID, allowing you to retrieve this quote-unquote trawl of traps. It used to be that there was floating ground line. We got rid of that. It's all sinking ground line. So it's still on the bottom and the whales can hit it, but it's less of a whale trap than it was. And then in the other half, we replace the vertical lines with an acoustic trigger that enables trap recovery without a persistent end line. We call this on-demand or ropeless fishing. Now, acoustic releases of bottom gear has been used by the defense and science and industry uh, since the 1960s and for fishing gear since at least 2012. Some colleagues of mine made an offshore system in 2016 at Woods Hole Oceanographic and there's probably 16 or 17 different flavors of how this work either with a, with um, a release of a buoyant spool of rope or a bag, bag of rope that is opened up and released or you can get an inflatable bag to send it back up to the vessel as well. So that's that's all very exciting, and it's become increasingly practical. It needs to become more affordable. So this is an animation that shows you what happens um, with um, the ropeless fishing, where there really isn't anything up in the surface here, and we're going to have a some acoustic trigger, and up it comes, and so you only have rope in the water column when the um, gear is being retrieved, so the whale's all happy. And it's the cap too. Okay, so the technology can and has been used in many different fisheries. It's uh, perhaps most advanced in terms of getting close to being a commercial reality with no requirement for an ex uh, exempted fishery permit in the black sea fish, black sea bass fishery in. Uh, in the Carolinas and you know the, there's real strong interest in reopening the winter fishery uh, by legalizing this on-demand fishing uh, it's essentially most attractive obviously when the fishermen are put out of work and they are told they can't fish with rope in the water column so their motivation to do that has been very high whether it be in the black sea bass fishery or the cape cod bay and a, a surrounding area fishery which was closed in 2015 and now in the last two years we've had folks out there fishing on demand making money and there are the whales and the same in Canada with the uh, snow crab fishery where we've got folks that's all still e experimental and it's it's, it's a separate uh, regulatory process and for a regular commercial permit but you know we first ran a a, a consortium meeting uh, in 2018 in Woods Hole to sort of pose this question and even then that first day the, the re representatives of the fishing industry told us we were crazy and by the end of the day they were told telling us how it might work and those same people now are um, waiting for response or proposals to get their hands on some more gear and so on. And there's been a huge change in how things are going. And we've had 
um, a major lending library of, of this kind of gear at the Woods Hole National Fishery Service Lab, and we've been closely involved with that. And actually a shout out here that the single biggest non-governmental donor to buying um, experimental acoustic released fishing gear is none other than SeaWorld. I have a relationship with SeaWorld veterinarians and they came to me and said, well, how can we help? And my answer was, well, you can help us with this experimental fishery with the ropeless gear. And that was the first major slug of money that the feds didn't have the bureaucratic wheels turning to make it happen. And so I was able to buy, you know, close to a million dollars worth of gear to throw at that gear library. Thank you to SeaWorld. And it's, it was an extraordinary investment on their behalf, risky, and I think it's taken off very, very well. So here, I played the video. I'm going to do it again. Maybe I didn't. So there we go. So what's going on is that it's a cage, often within a lobster trap, where the acoustic system is is there, and it's attached to one or both ends of the string of traps. And, you see it going like that. and then underwater, once it's been set, once the vessel returns to the location, using software and hardware, an acoustic signal is transmitted to the unit from that iPad or whatever, including the lease of the buoyant line up it goes, or an inflatable bag. And once at the surface, the unit's recovered and the traps are hauled, serviced, and reset. Pretty cool. And, you know, a friend of mine said, you know, fishermen say no, but if you put it in their hands, they can't actually um, say no because it's a matter of pride that they can make it work. And it's so true that some of the fishermen that have been at it this the longest have been become really, really good. Now, this guy in the orange pants here, Rob Martin, has been fishing ropelessly for about five years now, and he's part of the experimental fishery in um, Cape Cod Bay starting in February, and this is one of the lift bags that's come up. And here's three engineers working with him. This is a couple of years ago now, but... It's just a, um, it's a really wonderful thing to see. And, and, you know, it reminds me actually of an experience I had in Newfoundland in the um, late 70s where I got to work with a guy called John Lean who was a ornithologist and he got dragged into the humpback whale entanglement problem. And he went after it. And it was a serious economic cost to the intro cod trap fishery at the time. And he went after the, that in the context of working with the fishermen to help them retrieve their gear. He set up a fisherman's assistance program and he became a national hero. Well, certainly provincial hero in Newfoundland, but he got the order of Canada for the work he'd done in the Newfoundland fishery, working with these fishermen. And this was in 1970s and early eighties and John's passed now, but I was spent a lot of time on the Newfoundland coast this summer and, the quickest way to have a warm conversation with a fisherman was to mention John's name because they all they all, all knew of him. Many of them had worked with him and they all had huge respect for his cultural sensitivity and ability to make it work for both the fishermen and for the whales. So these areas here are all closed seasonally for whale conservation and the blue one and the, and the bottom green one have all been subject to fishery um, activity using the on-demand system this area here has not the state of maine has been quite reluctant and what they did was they said if you catch a, a lobster here ropelessly you're not going to land it in maine and so that may change and certainly there's quite a lot of interest in the state of Maine today, whilst there's a fair amount of grandstanding going on as well. And we've got, you know, these on-demand trial areas are going on not only in the coast of Maine, offshore Massachusetts, inshore Massachusetts, south of the islands, but also um, New Jersey and North and South Carolina, various different groups are doing that. So in summary, 
this project's all about communication and collaboration. And this photograph I took uh, was it last summer or the summer before, I think it was last, no, summer of 22 is what it was. Um, and each one of these people, we all went out to test something that is a critical piece of this whole on-demand thing, which is to replace the function of the buoy at the surface of the end line, which um, traditionally is the way not only do you haul it up, but you also know that there is gear set on the bottom and you don't set your gear on top of somebody else's or you don't tow the trap through there, tow, tow a, a trawl, a scallop trawl or a bottom trawl. And so one of the challenges is to move that function of identification of the gear to a screen. And it involves some argument as to how to do it well, but either you have a position from the global positioning system, the GPS from where you where you dropped it over the side of the boat, or you get an acoustically updated position uh, from the trap talking to the surface. And it, within this group here, she works for a conservation organization, she works for the government, he works for a, a um, manufacturer of this ropeless gear, so does he. Um, some of these guys work for the Allen Institute for AI, and they're working on getting the mapping sorted out. He, he's a, a law enforcement officer for NOAA. He's an engineer for NIMPS, and it goes on and on. But there's a lot of energy in that picture, which I, I just feel uh, tells a lot in terms of how you've got fishermen, law enforcement, uh, software gurus, and manufacturers sitting on a bunch of ropeless traps having had a really good day because it all worked out very well and I, that photograph means an awful lot to me because it's been it's been a long time coming so <laughs> over the years we've been able to define the problems facing north atlantic right whales where they may be at most at risk and potential solutions such as removing rope from the water column and moving ships out of whale habitat or slowing them down and I want to change the um, tone just a little bit for this last bit of the talk to give tell you a story about uh, the animal that we talked about at the beginning, the one I gave you the sort of the, the mind mind drop from. And that is really to give museums a bit of a shout out because the commonest samples to be secured by museums for this kind of work are bones and baleen because both tissues are resistant to decomposition. And you'll notice that if you've ever been involved in a North Atlantic right whale necropsy, the bones are often collected and, and the baleen too, if it's still available on the animal. Here we can see the baleen hanging down from the upper jaw of this animal, the same one we saw before, with its lips open with the animal swimming through the water, filtering out the plankton. Well, not the same whale, but here is a rack of baleen removed from a North Atlantic right whale number 1014 called Staccato. It was hit and killed by a ship in Cape Cod Bay in 1999. The horny baleen hangs from each of the upper jaws. So this is the, 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 the upper jaw edge here. And here you can see a, a plate of baleen. And there's a whole lot of baleen plates all in a row here. And these are all the hairs that come off the individual plates, but they aggregate to form a, a filter bed, a mat, so that the, the plankton gets caught up on the mat and the water goes back out through the gaps between the baleen. And so you get a, a slurry of uh, whale food for the animal to swallow as a sort of plankton soup on the other end. So <laughs> when we archived some of these plates from staccato at the Smithsonian, we had no idea that in a few years methods would be developed to measure how the concentration of hormones in the baleen could generate a record of pregnancy and stress in the animal through time. And so really, my message here is that very often, museums receive donations of materials from people who collected it for the sake of it. And we collected that baleen because it was the right thing to do. Well, turns out that the longest plates represent about the past 10 years of a whale's life because it grows kind of like fingernail. And we collect powdered samples of baleen. 
about every centimeter along the plate to try and figure out what the story is of the physiology of this animal through that 10 year time frame. So fast forward to the first, well, reverse back to the first whale that we looked at, the one with the with the rope wrapped around the baleen and, and up around its jaw and so on. And after its necropsy, we collected the bones and we also collected some baleen and they all went to the Smithsonian. And here, my colleague Nadine Lisiak is, is sampling that baleen at the Smithsonian. Each sample along the whole length being another time point along the last 10 years before the animal died. So here uh, we've got more pictures of this animal as to how it's entangled and so on. But what I want you to focus on is that the hormones levels, estradiol and cortisol, the stress levels and, and the sex hormones here are a very good predictor of how long, the, in this case, the pregnancy lasts. So you can see the pregnancy spikes here in this gray bar here. But then there was also another change here. And it was these changes in estradiol and cortisol and thyroxine all reflect the stress of the entanglement. So we're beginning to get to look at the personal sort of molecular diary, if you like, of this animal as it was pregnant and then also as it was entangled. And in fact, these chemical changes show that the animal was first sighted entangled about three months after it actually had been entangled on the basis of this evidence here. So, Another plug for museums is that, again, this is a um, dead right whale found on a beach in South Carolina in 2011 with the rope tightly bound and cutting deep into its right flipper. And this animal, oh, the catalog animal number 3993, had been seen with a similar entanglement nearby in very poor conditions. So we assume that the dead animal was that same ID, but the genetics didn't add up. But recently, uh, folks from the University of St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, used a new method with a sample from this this bone in a drawer in Suitland, Maryland, at the, at the uh, archive for the Smithsonian, to confirm that indeed it was three nine nine three. So it wasn't two separate whales entangled down there that year, but just one. So museums are critical in diverse ways for better understanding and conserving of endangered species. So with that, I'd like to wrap up and give you a few thoughts in terms of, well, because the question always raises, well, well, what do I do? And I guess my, my answer to that is that, well, awareness of the problems is the first thing. So read my book and read other papers listen to all the folks that are trying to help these animals and say what's going on and then push for the solutions. And I'm a strong believer in the enabling force of political will, because essentially the chain of consequence for right whales uh, goes from politicians who are listening to the priorities. What, what do their voters care about? And they vote, they care about, money in their pocket and getting their kids to school through college food on the table and all of the things that we all sweat about and we can't ever forget that but also um engagement in the broader pieces of things that i hope we care about more than it appears that we do currently because obviously we don't care enough as a society about north atlantic right wells to take the hits on the industries that provide our commercial goods and seafood that's caught by traps. So it is definitely a case of um, what do we carry, care about and how do we value these things? And politicians do listen to their voters if there is enough of a noise about it. And this isn't just about right whales. This is about you know climate change and the global loss of biodiversity is that it's a very short-sighted thing, in my view, to really not 
pay attention to the concerns that we're talking about tonight. So I read on a wall in, a, in an aquarium in Woods Hole, which is produced by the North National Marine Fisheries Service, the following statement that marine waters and resources belong to all Americans. And, you know, we don't say that very much. And it's something that's always been in the back of my mind. But that little plaque actually really crystallized the thought for me. And so lobbying politicians about your concerns is something that's really important, but also lobbying your suppliers. Uh, you can't walk into Walmart and say, excuse me, did the ship that delivered this stuff from China go at 10 knots or less? But you can talk to your server in a restaurant and say, well, was this seafood caught sustainably in whatever way? And there are various ways that there are the seafood certification processes, some of which are driven by funding from the industry. And it's it's none of it's easy and i'm not saying don't eat this don't eat that but try and be a positive force to making it a more sustainable product than it otherwise could be and i know that there are various ways to levels of um, intervention that you might consider and we can certainly discuss that but that's um that's what i have to say tonight and thanks for listening thank you dr moore um so one of the questions that I'll start with as as people are chiming in, <clears throat> you know, you, you talked about lobbying your politicians, which I think is exactly right. And speaking out and at 100 miles, we're really trying to connect folks with our decision makers. Um, but uh, some of the, the elected representatives that were at your hearing, um, which I, I understand was, was not the most productive last spring um, are right here in Georgia. Um, and they are advancing, you know, fairly dangerous narratives about a lot of these, a lot of these things. And so the 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 public dialogue becomes it's all or nothing. Like you're either on the side of the the lobster industry or you care about whales, and you can't possibly care about both, right? Or, um, you know, with well, you the can actually, right, yeah. right, right. But that's the that's the narrative that is is being put forth, right? And also. Oh. Um, with the ship speed regulations, we're getting lots of misinformation that we is verifiably false. But if you come out against that, then suddenly it's being painted as anti-ports or anti-business. And so what is some of the language that you have found that resonates to the, um, not even to the politicians, but to the, the folks that we need to reach to be able to speak out, to, to explain how you can be, you know, how, how there is a gray area where you can still sympathize with the industry and, and, and obviously care about the whales, but what's some of that language that, or messaging that you have found to be particularly impactful? Two words, mutual respect. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's hard to find sometimes, but we all have our own perspectives. And if we are to be successful, we need to pat around the room and go put your feet into the perspective of the people that you disagree with. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that, you will see why they're saying what they're saying. I mean, I've got a little bit of optimism there, but the word mutual respect really does set up um, for success as opposed to failure because you know, when I started working in Cape Cod Bay about eight years ago, I didn't know any of the fishermen in that area. And we both, we were all putting to sea from the same port. And gradually over the years, I've become much more comfortable with with all of them, both the ones that are doing the ropeless stuff and not. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to build relationships. And relationships are basically built on trust and respect. And in doing that, you can see what they need, what you need, and how it can come together. But ultimately, you know, we're in a society where law is still important and that has to, that is definitely part of it but you can have all the laws you want if you don't enforce them it's not much use right. so there's a 
there's the personal piece, but also there's the legislative piece and the enforcement piece. But ultimately, it all comes down to the fact that we're all humans and we all have some fundamental expectations that are good and we need to recognize that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I appreciate that. One question that we have that's come in is about the ropeless gear. Um, and, and do you have a, an idea of how much those, the ropeless gear costs? Is it, um, you know, what can be done to make it more affordable or accept, accept, you know, widely accessible so that it, that it does become the standard? Right. Well, the, the sort of bulletproof stuff is it's approximately $4,000 a unit. Now the unit could be servicing 20 or 40 traps. So it's not one for each trap by any means, but it's still a lot of money. Um, the benefits of the on-demand gear will be to reduce the amount of lost gear, most likely because the, the, the ropes aren't going to be at the service to get chopped off by propellers or whatever. Um, there are some benefits for one, one can have both ways as to whether it's it's some fishermen like to know where other people's gear is, where their gear is and other stones. So it's more of a cryptic way of marking it in general. But also there are more affordable options in the pipeline. I put a significant chunk of the SeaWorld money into a couple of different entities that are producing systems, one of which has been successful, the other one is not as yet. $300 a, a unit or maybe $600, depending upon how deep it goes. And so, you know, it's not inconceivable, but those units are not necessarily totally ready for market like the the bigger ones are, but we're working on the, on the smaller ones as well. Okay. Now, you mentioned both entanglements um, as well as ship speeds. Do you, um, you know, those are two competing threats or not competing, but two um, concurring threats. Um, the question is, would you say that preventing entanglement or managing ship speeds would be more helpful? I don't think we can achieve recovery without both. Mm -hmm. So um, for instance, there's a recent population viability analysis done by NOAA that showed that even if we reduce the amount of entanglement by 50%, the species would still be going down the tubes. And so, and I don't think we're going to get entanglement to zero, so therefore you need the vessel strikes as well. They both have to go down. A couple more questions. Um, are Southern Atlantic right whales and North Pacific right whales populations um, being impacted as in the same ways by fishing gear and ship strikes as we are seeing here with the North Atlantic right whales? Yes, but to a much lower degree. Um, the southern right whale is a pan global species, pan hemispheric species. So it's different to the North Pacific and North Atlantic in as much as they are regarded as different species, whereas the southern right whale is the same species, whether it be in the Atlantic, Pacific, or South Atlantic, South Pacific, or Australia, or wherever. So they were all knocked down to a similar level as the North Atlantic right whale in by about mid 1960s. There was a fair amount of illegal Russian whaling, especially in the South Atlantic. So, in contrast to the North Atlantic right whale, which never climbed out of the hole, they did to the tune of 20,000 or more. And so up until recently, there hasn't been a lot of concern, but now there is growing concerns from two aspects of it. There's been a major die off of the whales, southern right whales that go to Argentina, in particular to Peninsula Valdez, where they, they've often had, um, you know, 100 or more animals die in a year, which was obviously in the context of the size of the population isn't as devastating as it is to the North Atlantic right whale, but they're still uh, seeing some impacts for sure. And then, how are they going to go with this? Well, the North Pacific right whale really don't know much about it. 
as there's only about 30 of them in the, in the eastern sort of Bering Sea um, stock there. Yeah. But the other piece that is um, looming and significant for all of the southern right whale populations is the lack of krill, which has been driven in part by climate change and in part by overharvesting. You know, time and again, we will just knock off the top predators and then go for the base of the food chain, whether it be capelin or herring or menhaden or krill. It's just so dumb to eat the bottom of the food chain on the table. If you, well, in some ways it isn't. It's a more efficient use of the energy, but you're never going to maintain a diverse food chain. And we know that predator driven, predator dominated populations do better. And so, you know, short term gain, long term loss is what's going on. And that's true for the whole resource extraction of this entire globe. Mm. Too many humans. It's very simple. But, you know, one of the other pieces to that question is if you look at a globe, 90% of the humans live north of the equator. And so given that, the vessel strike pressures, the entanglement pressures in the southern hemisphere are inherently less because there's less dry land to keep your feet on. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think I have three more questions unless any others come in. Um, do you have any information about the impact um, of the acoustic triggers on the right whales? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting question, and I'm not particularly well qualified to answer, but I'll try. Um, Christopher Clark, who used to work at Cornell, has been the champion of this problem, and he's he's right. It's kind of like the cocktail party effect, where there's enough noise you can't necessarily hear what your neighbor's saying, and if if what your neighbor's saying is is critical to finding food or sex, then it's a it's an issue. And to the extent that it is an issue, we don't really know, but it can't be negative negligible by any means. And just to, to sort of get into the sort of elephant in the room with regards to wind farms just for a minute, um, the evidence that the current mortality of humpback whales along the East Coast, in New Jersey, New York in particular, is associated with exposure to exploration for wind farm pylon sightings is is non-existent uh, the evidence that is clear is that they've been hit by vessels mostly which may well have been um, vessels involved to some degree in in exploration for wind energy sites uh, no question about that either but in terms of the kind of acoustics that are being used to cite these pylons there's really no good evidence and it's, it's one of the more because of the sort of perfect storm between dead whales associated with the coincidence but not causal relationship between that and the wind the wind energy expansion uh, it's crazy but it doesn't mean to say that the wind isn't going to be a problem for right whales but i don't think it's killing them as people are claiming in terms of humpbacks Interesting. Okay. so two more um and let's see how can we, I think this is a really interesting question, you know, as whales start to appear up in our, in our coastal waters and we hear about them in our newspapers, but we don't often see them. So in person, you know, you being the exception, maybe in the room today, how can we can better connect people is the question to a species they may never see in person in their lifetimes. Yeah. Yeah. To get them to care. Yeah. Yeah, well, I wrote that book, and it um, it didn't get on the New York Times bestseller list. I know that, and I I wish I knew the answer to this question because if I did, I'd do it. Um, but I mean, certainly in New England, the in the last ten years, the North Atlantic right whale has become a common feature in popular media, much more so than ever did before. I mean. Some people don't want to hear it, but a, a lot of people are much more cognizant of of the problem and the challenge than they were 10 years ago. Now, the, the problem and the challenge has got substantially worse in the last 10 years, but I think we've done a pretty good job of talking about it. And so that's a good thing. Um, 
I don't know. It's tough. It's really tough. New England, obviously, the Boston Globe um, and others have have done a, a good job um, of, like you said, highlighting it and, and covering stories. I just posted one in the chat, the article from almost, I guess, a decade ago, um, the Chasing Bela, um, which you are featured prominently in. And I uh, encourage everyone to to read that profile if, if you haven't already. We can send that out as well. Um, but our final question, and I'm not sure if it's a an uplifting one to end on or not, but you know, you showed the the chart earlier, which shows um, right whales becoming potentially functionally extinct, not only within our lifetime, but within a very short time span. And obviously, the new numbers have have modified that somewhat. But the question is, do you have hope? And that's probably one that you get quite a bit. And um, I, I suppose also I would add on to that just a personal question, and that's whether that that answer is yes or no. How do we keep going in the face of these losses that we see every season, and and the challenges that we're we're encountering? Um, how do we keep going as advocates? Well, I don't think the question is any different to um, what our hopes and fears are on the national and global political scene. Um, are we on the cusp of making breakthroughs for healthy habitats and populations across the world, or are, are we documenting the, the end? Um, well, we've always been more pessimistic as we get older, I think. And knife was never as good as it was the time before and when I was a kid and so on. So that gives me hope because that does seem to be a rule of life that we get grumpier and, and more pessimistic as we get older. So, you know, sometimes I have a hard time opening the computer in the morning because of, of the kind of depression you're talking about, no question. But the, on the other hand, um, there is an irrepressible curiosity and optimism that we all have to grasp and go for and carry on. And, you know, miracles have happened, situations have developed, uh, technology has enabled, and it's, technology is trashed as well. Technology has trashed our information system in, in some ways. But nonetheless, you know, we can do it with going to the moon or making a COVID vaccine in, you know, three months or whatever it was. I mean, you know, the the quality of medical care we all get these, or the majority of us get these days, is extraordinary. It's because we care about it. You know, we can fix this problem. It's not rocket science. But as I said in the beginning, we have to care more than we do. And so fundamentally, it comes down to caring and attitude and priorities and it's not this or that it can be them both and it can happen and it can happen easily if people are willing to step up and make it happen i agree well and that's the challenge that that lies before all of us um and and why we're so grateful for you being here tonight and spreading your message and um i encourage everyone to read the book um, and continue to follow, um, if you're not already signed up at 100miles.org, we have an opportunity for you to join, um, there, uh, to get action alerts. And we have a number of them that go out related to our wildlife, to our, um, North Atlantic right whales. So we, we pledge to, uh, continue to let people know on this call and, and more broadly what they can do. And I, I hope we'll, get the opportunity to work with you again, um, Dr. Moore, in the in the near future on some of these campaigns to think through, um, you know, it's the urban whale and it, it travels down from your coast to our coast um, and how we can all try to have a voice in its protection. Cool. So, um, well, um, if for those of you on the call, if you didn't already know, um, this weekend is the, speaking of opportunities to connect people, there's the 
uh, Right Whale Festival in Amelia Island on Saturday and Sunday. It's Right Whale Week there this week. So we encourage you to go there um, and really support particularly the businesses who are who are um, helping to put on Right Whale Week. And then next week, or uh, let's see, the 13th um, kicks off Right Whale Week in the Savannah area or Whale Week in the Savannah area. So there's lots of opportunities to get involved and learn more. Um, but Dr. Moore, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time tonight and all that you are doing um, to help us protect the species and save the species, we hope. All right. Well, good to see you all. Good to see you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. See you next week or next month, we hope. <laughs>